<clears throat> All right, Mr. Daniel, thanks so much for coming in for your annual eye exam. So we just want to check your perception. All you got to do is read these words out. We'll go from there. All right. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead. Kenneth Copeland Ministries. <laughs> your perception is perfect. Get out of here. Okay, great. The theology that states that it's always God's will to heal is truly a disgusting and oppressive one, and it's not biblical at all. Now, I confess, I get very fleshy about individuals that say that it's always God's will to heal who aren't healed themselves, but will easily say, well, your daughter died of cancer because you didn't have enough faith for her healing. This notion that God always wants to heal, and it's dependent on your measure of faith as to whether or not you receive it, is a ludicrous and completely unbiblical theology. At its most basic level, the evidence that this isn't a biblical theology at all is typically right in front of our faces, or, as you will see today, on them. Today we'll be checking out a teaching from the family of the Kenneth Copeland Ministries via George and Terry Pearsons. Please don't forget to pray for these individuals and those who are deceived by them, and I'm so glad you're here. I love you. Please don't forget to subscribe, and let's do this thing. Help me, Jesus. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory. I'm Pastor George Pearsons, and this is my amazing, beautiful, brilliant, talented, gifted wife. Whoa, 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 wait a second. This, why is it so blurry? Is this a setting or? Oh. Ah, oh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> it's always God's will to heal. And you know the sentence that's about to come out of my mouth. Never trust a faith healer wearing glasses. Pray for these people. Just pray. We're talking about this week and next, 10 days of healing. We are focusing in on the healing power of God. Uh, <laughs> we have to operate in love. But is it just me or the word focus? is probably not the best word to use. It, it, it's just, it is so hypocritical. I'm gonna speed up the video just a little bit, guys. I remember, Terry, when I first came here, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, 1976, and as I was looking through all the books that the ministry had at the time, there was a book that Gloria had called God's Will is Healing. It's healing. God's Will is Healing. I and that, that book this morning. That phrase has stuck with me all of these years, and, and it is what we believe and receive from the Word of God. It is God's will for you to be healed. Believe it, receive it, take it, and know that it is God's most, most gracious desire in our lives to see these physical bodies made well to the place where he created them. And which scripture says that? That is a literal lie. There is no scripture that says it's God's most gracious desire for us to be physically well. So why don't we check out a couple of quick verses from the Bible instead of Gloria's book and see what God's desire actually is. 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God desires that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Salvation is clearly associated with coming to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. One cannot be saved apart from at least some kind of understanding of who Jesus is and what he did to save us. So you can see very quickly in the very beginnings of this teaching, what is supposedly illustrated as the most gracious desire of God himself for you to be physically well has somehow basically replace the gospel because God's desire is that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. When you say something like this is God's most gracious desire, that is a serious statement that needs to be seriously tested because the ramifications of understanding God's desire in and of themselves are truly serious. Already God's desire of the truth of Jesus Christ has been exchanged for selfish 
physical well-being. And we've only just gotten started. And I say this with the most amount of love I can muster in this moment, but this teaching and this ministry that relies so heavily upon it are truly oppressive and disgusting influences on the body of Christ. God's will is healing. I and that, that book this morning. That phrase has stuck with me all of these years, and, and it is what we believe and receive from the Word of God. It is God's will for you to be healed. You know, you were, as you were talking, and I just, I just had this uh, immediate impression. I believe that it's from the Lord and Him saying to you right now, and that is, if you only understood mm. two things, how much I hate sickness, how much I hate disease, how much I, I don't want that, as much as I don't want that, is how much I want you well. So we're supposed to believe that the Lord put an impression on you right now that Oh, man, it just, he hates for us to have sickness. And you're sitting here wearing glasses. So then we know your book isn't true. We know that your theology doesn't work. And so we're then supposed to believe that the Lord just spoke to you. Healing is not promised this side of heaven. Let's check this out real quick. Let's start out with 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. This is obviously talking about a future occurrence. Philippians 3.20 but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to subject all things to him will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Lastly, in Romans 8, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We await a future event. We don't have our glorified bodies yet, and the Pearsons are unable to provide any scripture that promises physical healing today or that it's God's most gracious desire. He is a loving father, and we need to know that. Yes. How much when you see a child, your child, who's not feeling well, or a grandchild not feeling well, and how, how you desire for them to be well and to be whole. Well, if we feel that way, as natural parents, how much more, how much more, how much more does the Father want us to walk in the fullness of what he created us to be. So we see Blurry George here set up a pretty significant straw man attempt. Oh, we don't want to see our children sick, but comparing a holy and sovereign God with the will and desires of fleshy man is not an appropriate conflation of subjects. God often sends sickness in the Bible. You only have to look at something like the senses of David in 1 Chronicles or the promise of God sending a sickbed in Revelation 2. God cares for our salvation where we will inherit new glorified bodies. So he literally has no reason to promise healing for these stinky, hairy, and in my case, quite flatulent bodies. And again, remember, you're being instructed here by individuals with faulty and unhealed vision who wrote a book 50 years ago and still aren't healed, and then utilize a straw man tactic to compare the will of God per healing to a loving parent. Healing is by the will of God and for his glorification. Consider the man in John chapter 9. Now as Jesus was passing by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God could be displayed in him. While it is daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud, and applied it to the man's eyes. Then he told him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. It's also relevant to know that John 9 is very powerful because it illustrates, starting in verse 35, when Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found the man and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? He replied, Tell me so that I may believe in him. You have already seen him, Jesus answered. He is the one speaking with you. Lord, I believe, he said, and he worshipped Jesus. The man that Christ healed in John 9 didn't even know who Jesus was. Therefore, he couldn't have had faith in Christ in order to receive his healing. It's the same situation with the man in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethesda, who didn't ask Jesus for healing, didn't know who Jesus was, and therefore he couldn't have had faith in him in order to receive healing. It's also good to remember that of the 28 actual healings that Christ performed in the Gospels, only 25% of those make any mention of faith. The evidence that receiving healing has anything to do with our measure of faith is drastically and dominantly outweighed by the fact that it's done by God's will and for his glory. We have faith in what God's will is and the faith that he has the empowerment to do so. I want you to consider also 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So now the spectacle twins have to illustrate that if we ask according to God's will, then they have to show that it is always God's will to heal. To know the will of God, we can be confident. What a wonderful place in prayer to be confident of the things we're asking him. Yeah. And if we ask him according to his will, we can be sure he's not going to say no. He's not going to. Faith for healing would stop wherever that question mark is. When yeah. you say, well, I just yeah. don't know if it's his will. Yeah. Well, if you don't know, then you can't come boldly to the throne. Hebrews 4, 16 yeah, says. That's right. That's right. Concerning healing, we must no longer use the faith-destroying phrase, if it be thy will. It's settled. It's done. It's over. Jesus paid the ultimate price for us to be healed and to be well. To be well, Faith for healing begins where the will of God is known. That is such a disgusting statement. So was it faith destroying then when Christ himself taught the disciples how to pray? Here in Matthew 6, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So Christ was teaching faith-destroying statements according to what you just said. Was Christ speaking multiple faith-destroying statements when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane about to die for our sins, praying to the Father as follows in Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, At that time Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he told them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then Jesus returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Were you not able to keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not enter into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. A second time, he went he went away and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, may your will be done. And again, Jesus returned and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. You've created no foundation that it is God's will to heal. You have illustrated that we should pray according to his will. But if we say, if it be thy will, that it is a faith-destroying statement, you have shown that the way that Christ taught the disciples to pray is somehow faith-destroying. Then you've also illustrated that Christ himself destroys faith by praying in such a way that he did to the Father. I ask you to pray for this man because this is disgusting. And again, what is that on your face that allows you to read those notes? You know, this is not something that Brother Copeland came up with or Sister Copeland, not Brother Hagen. It goes all the way back to God himself <laughs> yes, when he said does. in Exodus, I am the Lord who heals you. Yeah. But I do like to go back sometimes. So okay, why don't we actually read that verse? Exodus 15, starting in verse 24. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? 
And Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and when he cast it into the waters, they were sweetened. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he tested them, saying, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes, and pay attention to his commands, and keep all his statutes, then I will not bring on you any of the diseases I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Terry, were you in Egypt? Did you see the diseases? So is this verse talking specifically to you? And does it also show that it's always God's will to heal? Does the Lord heal? Yeah. He is an all-powerful, sovereign, and gracious God. Is healing promised? Not at all. And there isn't a single scripture promising physical healing on this side of heaven. It literally says, if you keep my statutes and my commands, the old covenant, then I will not bring on you the diseases of the Egyptians. And just because God says, I am the Lord who heals you, it doesn't mean I am the Lord who always heals. For anyone can have a steadfast faith for the healing in their body. They must be rid of all uncertainty concerning God's will in the matter. Appropriating faith cannot go beyond one's knowledge of the revealed will of God. Do you see now how oppressive and disgusting this teaching is? You have to make sure that you have full certainty. You have to have enough faith. And yet they have still not proven with their glasses and unhealed eyes that it is always God's will to heal. The Bible shows God sending sickness, promising sickness. Timothy was sick. Paul was sick. Christians today are sick. False teachers wear glasses. God heals, absolutely, but always according to his will. His promises are each a revelation of what God is eager to do for us. Until we know what God's will is, there is nothing to base our faith on. You want to pick up there with that, Terry? Well, the point that we made earlier is that these things come by faith. Yeah. Uh, the healing, Jesus said to the woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5, thy faith has made thee whole. He probably didn't say thy faith. That was, you know, but anyway, he said, your faith has made you whole. Yeah. And then in James, yeah. the Bible says that the prayer of faith save will save the sick. The sick. Mm -hmm. So until we know what... Okay. Yes, Mark 5 does say that. But this is part of the problem in the Word of Faith that I experienced being in the Word of Faith for over 23 years. The belief that your faith is like a container that activates your blessing, your anointing, or your healing. But this is nowhere taught in Scripture, in fact, quite the opposite. And as we've already shown, it is when we ask God anything according to His will. Mark chapter 5 and the woman with the issue of blood is a typical go-to for word of faith adherents that are trying to push the narrative that your measure of faith can somehow twist God's arm into activating the healing. But the problem is, as we've already shown, including this particular healing, 75% of Christ's own healings in the Gospels, this being one of them, 75% of those make no mention of faith. The woman with the issue of blood had faith in Christ's ability to do so. How much faith did Lazarus have in order to be resurrected? How much faith did the man in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethesda have in Christ, even though he didn't know him? How much faith did the man in John chapter 9 have in Christ, even though he didn't know him? And I always like to give you guys kind of like a kill shot. I hate that term, but I mean, it is what it is. And I have a very small vocabulary, okay? How is it? that we have enough faith for a far, far greater miracle, eternal life with the living, sovereign, holy God and the complete absolution of our sins through the works of Christ. We have enough faith for that. And yet somehow you teach that we don't have enough faith for something so much smaller like 2020 vision. Beloved friends, this is Swiss cheese theology that is being taught by individuals who couldn't see themselves out of a maze, let alone rightly handle the word of God. And again, you can't really offer just a small portion of a scripture, i.e. cherry picking, in order to push this theology and just think you can wipe your hands of it and therefore it's settled. So sure, she utilizes James 5, where we see here, is any one of you sick? Here in verse 14, is any one of you sick? He should call the elders to the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. 
But then you have to kind of ask yourself, well, how do we offer a prayer in faith? Well, it's weird because Christ taught, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we only have to go back again to 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You cannot dissect one verse away from another saying, well, I offered this prayer in faith, so it has to happen. Offering a prayer in faith of his ability and of his will. So you can see how individuals like this like to use machine gun theology, where they're just inundating the listeners with tons and tons of scriptures, but all with usually flashy buzzwords and completely out of context. And then what she goes on to say is just pure evil. God's will is there's nothing to base your faith upon. Right. The first step toward being healed is the same as the first step toward salvation or any other blessing that God promises. For that is for the sick person to know what the Bible clearly yes. teaches, yes. that it's God's will to heal until one has lived out the allotted span <laughs> God. of life. Each individual sufferer must be convinced by the word of God that his or her healing is the will of God. For it is impossible to have faith, real faith, for healing as long as there is the slightest doubt as to it being God's will. Yeah, exactly. It's that is such a burden and a millstone around the neck of people who are desperately sick. If you have the slightest doubt, then you're not going to get your healing. Again, she doesn't use a scripture. And you can see now it's all about your faith. And if you have the slightest doubt, then you don't get a healing. And again, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but I want to drive home 75% of Christ's own healings in the Gospels make no mention of faith. Christ healed people that didn't know who he was, so they couldn't have. And what are you even reading? Because it's certainly not the Bible, and you're only able to do so because you're wearing glasses due to your unhealed and flawed eyesight. The first step toward being healed is the same as the first step toward salvation or any other blessing that God promises. For that is for the sick person to know what the Bible clearly yes, teaches, yes. that it's God's will to heal. And she literally said it's the same as the first step for salvation, the same as the first step for salvation. And this is what crumbles her theology. Salvation involves faith in Christ for a far greater miracle, eternal life with the holy and glorious King and the complete redemption away from our sins through the works of Jesus Christ. Yet, I don't have enough faith for my eyesight to be healed. This is truly, truly evil and it's not taught biblically and these i'm sorry sycophants spit in the eyes of those who are in wheelchairs those who breathe through tubes in their throats they spit on those who have seizures and panic attacks and tumors and it's their fault because they didn't have enough faith which is not only unbiblical but these suffering individuals are then left to just blame god in sheer despair which leads them to completely walking away from the faith. This teaching literally feeds hell, and it literally kills people. Faith must rest on the will of God alone, not on our desires or our wishes. Terry? So people say, well, if it's his will, why didn't it just come on me? Well, that's not the way that yeah. God created us to be. He gave you and me, he gave us a choice. Right. He gave us a will to be involved in this. We are to be co-laborers with God. He has done his part, will continue to do his part, will uphold his part with the power of his word, but you and I have a part to, uh, to, to bring this faith action to work. And he says, we have to come to him and receive from him because it's our choice, yeah. but we can't confidently receive from him if we don't know what his will is. Because God will not do something apart from his will. You can't con God, you can't coerce God, you can't fool God into doing something that's crosswise with his will. Oh dear. The choice of salvation, of choosing to believe in Christ, 
has nothing to do with choosing to be healed. And as a juxtaposition, I seriously doubt that anybody chooses to have cancer. Did you choose to have flawed eyesight? And why isn't that healed, by the way? Again, the man in John 5 didn't choose healing because he didn't know who Jesus was. John 9, he didn't choose healing because he didn't know who Jesus was. Christ, again, in the beginning of John 9, as we've seen, states that it is God's will that he may be glorified. And here's another really cool one that, again, just takes apart what she's saying. So this is Luke chapter 4, where Christ heals at Peter's house. But it's very interesting to see what they do here, because it actually lines up with the Word of God. Starting in verse 38, after Jesus had left the synagogue, he went to the home of Simon, whose mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. So they appealed to Jesus on her behalf, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up at once and began to serve them. She's awesome. She didn't ask Jesus to heal her. She didn't make a choice. But what we actually see here is the individuals, Peter and everybody hanging out, appealed to Jesus. They asked him. They did as the Bible instructs us to ask according to his will. No mention of faith activating the healing or making a choice. Just like all of the other examples I've used 317 times in this video, I'm sorry, <laughs> but they're relevant and they show that this is a fractured and false teaching. Another good one is Mark chapter 3. This is the man with the withered hand. Once again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man with a withered hand was there. In order to accuse Jesus, they were watching to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Stand up among us. And he asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or do evil, to save life or destroy it? But they were silent. Jesus looked around at them with anger and sorrow at their hardness of heart. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And so he stretched it out and it was restored. No mention of the man's faith and no mention of the man making a choice. These disgusting individuals are teaching that we should walk up to people in wheelchairs or with significant diseases and say, why aren't you choosing your healing? Not biblical, not exemplified, and most definitely not Christ-like. So you're going to see now a very typical word of faith motion stating that Jesus always healed everyone that came to him, and this is also a fully fallacious teaching, and they use it to embolden this false presupposition that they've implanted that it's always God's will to heal, which we've effectively taken apart. But watch what they do with the fact that Jesus always healed those that came to him. So what did Jesus do? He did what he saw the Father do to fulfill the Father's will, and he would he healed people. But what about that time, you know, where the people came to him, yeah. and they said, Master, we want to be healed, and he said, no, you can't be healed right now because it's the will of God that you hold that for a few more days, come back in another month or two because you really got something you need to learn through this. No, no. What about that time? Uh-uh. Wait, that's not in the Bible? Didn't happen. Not in the Bible? Mm -mm. Gee, I thought it was. Nope. I heard that. No, nope. not, not in the Bible? No. Nope. So no instance at all where Christ walked away from people that are looking for healing? So typically, a approach to this would be individuals utilizing John 5, showing that Christ doesn't always heal. Uh, because at the Pool of Bethesda, it does say here, sometime later, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool with five covered colonnades, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda. On these walkways lay a great number of the sick, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And the position is often that Christ healed the singular individual and then left, therefore trying to illustrate that Christ doesn't always heal. But there's a far greater example to be found in Mark chapter 1. And this is definitely one of those chapters where we have to make sure we understand the weight of the context at hand. So Mark chapter 1 is right after Christ again heals at Peter's house with his mother-in-law, but starting after that incident in verse 32. That evening, after sunset, people brought to Jesus all who were sick and demon-possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill and drove out many demons. But he would not allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and slipped out to a solitary place to pray. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. So stop right there for a second. Why? Why is everyone in Mark 1 looking 
for Jesus. The context is clear that Jesus is performing miraculous healings, casting out demons. The people are seeking him out. They weren't seeking him out because he was a fantastic guitar player. It doesn't say that the whole town was gathering at his door because he was dropping some hot bars with some amazing freestyle rap. Christ was healing the multitudes and people were seeking him accordingly. But when Simon says to him, everyone is looking for you, how does Christ reply? But Jesus answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so I can preach there as well, for that is why I have come. So he went through Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Christ walks away from a crowd that was gathering at his door for healings and casting out demons. And he also makes it abundantly clear, I didn't come for healing and casting out demons. Let us go to the neighboring towns to preach for that is why I have come, because it is the gospel that is the power unto salvation. And it looks like the beloved, glorious Christ Jesus didn't heal the vision of these two wolves either. I think this is all that I can take from these hypocritical thieves for the day. Please understand this. This is a demonic doctrine that I was under for over 23 years. My family is still under this teaching and they are not healed at all. The word of faith has an understandable appeal in that we can have prosperity and always be made wealthy and well. But it's not biblical, it's empirically and visibly false, and it oppresses people to the point that they walk away from Christ altogether. My beloved friend, I ask that you would pray for these people, for God wishes that none should perish. We war in love, and I am so grateful for you. I'm so humbled. And I'm so honored that you would spend a single minute with me. Please don't forget to subscribe. God bless. Mad love. And I'll see you in the next one.